CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. We are a nest of singing birds, said Mr. Samuel Johnson. True. And probably all of our chatter and clamor means no more than the scolding of magpies, the rasping of ravens, and the jabbering of jays. And whether our voices speak in the limpid melodies of the nightingale or the hoarse croaking of the crow, it little matters. All is soon swiftly borne away and lost in the wind. Stretchers! I accuse you, Enius Carlyle, of murder! Don't start the car, Rodriguez. I want to listen to this agitator. You, Mr. Carlyle, are a murderer! And you, my friend, belong in an asylum. I warn you, Mr. Carlyle. Change your ways, or... Or, or what? Or tomorrow morning may find you in another world. mystery drama, Neatness Counts, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Joan Shea and Ralph Bell. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule. I'll be back shortly with Act One. who are merely rich seem to have fallen by the wayside. Today, only the fabulously rich can maintain magnificent mansions, staffed, it would appear, by an unlimited number of domestics. Yes, there are quite a few people with money. But how many live as if this were still the gilded age, when the men who gouged and hacked out their fortunes really enjoyed their wealth and considered themselves an elite and didn't feel ashamed of their riches. One such we're about to meet, and his name is Aeneas Carlyle. And what an unreconstructed old sinner he is. You wish to see me this morning, sir? Yes, Mrs. Paulson, now... What is that confounded noise outside? Oh, that, sir. I uh, didn't wish to disturb you. Well, woman, what is it? My name is not woman. I know what your name is. What's that noise? It... Well, well, it seems someone is picketing the house. Picketing? Picketing? About what? I believe it's the Colby's Petrels. What the deuce are the Colby's Petrels? They're birds, Mr. Carlyle. What have I got to do with them? Well, it seems, sir, that you are killing them. Am I? Yes, sir. It seems you are destroying their grounds. Their grounds? Yes, sir. Their mating and nesting grounds. All this is news to me. Well, you see, Mr. Carlyle, up in Stewart's Island... What about Stewart's Island? Well, sir, you own it. Yes, I know I own it. You are conducting tests there. I think it's a chemical reduction process, and there are fumes. Fumes, fumes? What kind of fumes? Noxious fumes. I've been there. You can't smell a thing. I know that. Human beings can't smell the fumes, but it seems they poison the birds. The birds? The Colby's petrels. Biologically, somehow, the fumes and the accompanying vapor which settles down on the the habitat, I believe they call it. Get to the point. Somehow, it causes sterility. That is, among the Colby's petrels. And that's why that idiot out there is all excited? I believe so. Open that window. Uh, Yes, sir. Idiots, Carlyle, Satoon! I accuse you of murder! Murder of one of the Lord's innocent creatures! Cruel and godless murderer destroyed! That will be enough. Close that window. Oh, yes, Mr. Carlyle. Mr. Carlyle, the Colby's petrel is an endangered species. Meaning what? Meaning nothing. Now, what did I want to see you about? Oh, yes, yes. I don't like the flower beds around the sides of the house. Oh, sir, it's difficult to... Uh, to... Uh, to what? To maintain flowers in the city. It is? Yes, sir. What with the soot and the grime, the dust-laden atmosphere... Those flowers have no life, no color. They're a sorry excuse for blossoms. I want you to fire Judson. 
Fire, Judson? He's the gardener. It's his fault. But he's an old man, sir. Which probably accounts for it. He's no longer fit to do a day's work. But, sir, Judson grew old in your service. He's been paid for it. He's only been getting... He's been getting what he's worth. Had he been able to earn more elsewhere, he'd have gone there. You're letting him go, sir? Well, does that mean you intend to pension him off? Why on earth should I do that? Well, he's worked here for almost 50 years, starting in your father's time. Was an agreement ever made that he would receive a pension? No, but it was understood. Understood by whom? Well, the... The man has very little money. He should have developed the habit of thrift. In his family, sir, there have been some very long and expensive illness. He sent three children through college. Let him go live with one of them. Well, I'm sure he's too proud. Why are we having this discussion, Mrs. Paulson? Because you just asked me to fire Judson. Yes, and on that subject, why has it become necessary for me to ask? Why? Yes, why? Your housekeeper here, you're in charge of all the help. When you see that someone's work is no longer up to snuff, it's your duty to terminate his or her employment, is it not? Well? And therefore, had you been performing your own job satisfactorily, you would have fired Judson long ago. Are you saying... You're dissatisfied with my work? Uh, let me tell you something, woman. I'm never satisfied. Don't call me woman. Damn it, I'll thank you not to interrupt. And I'll thank you, sir, not to use profanity in my presence. I'll talk any way I please, and if you don't like it, you can quit. Very well. I quit. It is proper to give two weeks' notice. This is the tenth day of the month. I shall leave your employ on the 24th. Is there anything else, Mr. Carlyle? No, I must leave for the office. Is Rodriguez out front with the car? Yes, sir. That'll be all. Searchers, I accuse him of Carlyle of murder. Now look here, young man. What hey. sort of nonsense is this? Nonsense? The destruction of an entire species? And you call it nonsense? Now, now, don't start the car for a moment, Rodriguez. I want to talk to this agitator. Agitator? I is that what you call me? That's what you are, aren't you? Murder is being done. Murder? Who's being murdered? The Colby's Petrol. You're talking about a bird. It was created by God. Now, it has its place in the scheme of things. What place? What good does your Colby's Petrol do? It lives. It flies. It has its own life. I understand that. But of what use is it? It doesn't have to be of any use. What I am doing on Stewart Island is of use to people. It will save energy. It will lower the price of building materials. People will have more and better houses. Yeah, and you will fill your pockets with gold. You don't expect me to do it for nothing, do you? <sighs> you, you must not have the awful power to sacrifice an innocent creature. You just can't wipe out a living creature because, because it gets in your way. It's the way of the world. Then it's the wrong way. And something has to be done about it. Why don't you get a job and earn an honest living? Well, maybe I have to take matters into my own hands. Become somebody. Yeah, become somebody by stopping this vicious and obscene slaughter. All right, let us be on our way, Rodriguez. Let it start with me. Let it begin with the Colby's petrol. Let this tiny, obscure bird become the turning point. Oh, I warn you, Mr. Carlyle, change your way. And I warn you, young fella, there's a difference between free speech and making a public nuisance of yourself. Don't let tomorrow find you here. You understand? For all your wealth and power and influence, tomorrow may not find you here either. Is that the fact? The Colby's petrol, a ragged little wisp of a bird. But maybe he has friends who are more loving, more devoted, and more daring than any of yours. Yes? That was Mr. Bowers. Mr. John Jacob Bowers, eh? <laughs> he doesn't need an appointment. Send him in. Well, well, the early bird gets the worm. Where were you, Mr. John Jacob Bowers, the day the teacher taught that in school, playing hooky? <laughs> A pity. Well, J.J., come in, come in. Have a chair. <clears throat> oh, hello, Anis. Cigar? You know I don't smoke. That's right, you don't. A drink? I don't drink either. You have absolutely no vices. What do you do with all your time, anyhow? I try to enjoy life in his. Why do you have to try? I do it without any effort whatsoever. Ah, you don't enjoy life at all. 
Is that a fact? Yes, you have no appreciation of art, literature, music. I enjoy making money. That's the difference between us. Well, I'll tell you another difference between us. I'm not in your office with my hat in my hand. I uh, haven't come here to beg. What have you come here for? To see if we could have a reasonable discussion. Have you ever found me unreasonable? You drive a hard bargain. It takes two to make a bargain. If one party doesn't like it, why doesn't he go elsewhere? And yes, your options fall due on the 30th. Yes, I have that noted on my calendar. Bowers to deliver 10,000 shares of Amalgamated at 40. I, uh, I, I know, I know. So what is the problem? You know full well what the problem is. Amalgamated selling at 90. And you have to go out and buy 10,000 shares of it. That stock had no business going up. Ah, but it did. Because it has been manipulated, exploited. Now, the value isn't there, and you know it. That stock is going to plummet down through the floor. If it does that before the 30th, you'll do very well indeed, J.J. But it won't. I know it won't. I was I to know that you and, and, and the whole syndicate would go in there and inflate the price. That's the way of the world, my <sighs> friend. Your world, maybe. Nobody asked you to come and play in it. What are you complaining about, J.J.? You gambled and lost. But the game was fixed. What's your complaint? You'll have to buy your 10000 at 90 and deliver it at forty. You only stand to lose half a million. What's that to a man in your position? You don't know my position very well. Oh, now, don't plead poverty. I simply can't raise that much money all at once. Then do you want to ruin me? I can. I have a right to. But I don't want to. Still, you're going to do it. The option. I could tear it up right now. But you won't. I might. You know that painting of yours? I will never sell it. I want it. Why do you want it? I like it. Let me have it. And you're out from under. But, uh, but it isn't worth half a million dollars. I know. But I like it. It's valuable. It's a cane, but it'll, it'll never be worth half a million. I like it. I swore I would never let it go. Then I shall expect you to deliver 10,000 shares of Amalgamated on the 30th. Uh, incidentally, uh, buy some now. It's going up even more. My wife will never speak to me again if I sell that portrait. You are not selling it. You're giving it away. Why? Why are you doing this? I am a rich man. I can afford to indulge my whims, my fancies. What's the point in having money if you can't enjoy it? Has it ever occurred to you that your enjoyment is based on someone else's misery? Oh, yes, quite often. Shall we draw up the papers? I will release you from your obligation and you shall present me with Aurora by Duquesne. Well? You win. We both win. You've learned a lesson on how not to sell short. And I've been enriched by a great work of art. Do you know something in this? One day, somebody is going to put a stop to you. Really? You know something, my friend? That doesn't bother me one bit. And it doesn't. Because he gets so many threats. Here, just in one morning alone, he has callously tossed a faithful old retainer into the street. He has provoked an extremely valuable housekeeper into quitting her job. He has infuriated a highly idealistic young man and tightened the screws on a business associate. You must admit he has ruffled a great many feathers. The question is, will any of these chickens come home to roost? I'll continue shortly with Act Two. those people who have the gift, or is it truly a gift, to live for themselves alone, to place themselves in the center of the universe, to respond to no one's needs but theirs, to constantly sing a song that has but one note, me, to be oblivious to and unconscious of anyone else's hope or want unless it can serve their own purpose. Yes, all of us are born alone and must die alone 
But these are people who choose to live alone. Do you have your market list, Joanna? Well, it's, it's here somewhere. Uh, now, really, Joanna, you must learn to be more efficient. Why? <laughs> Look at you, Harriet. Could any human being be more efficient than you? And where did it get you? I have to go over your bill. Oh, you're a fool. To quit your job over an old reprobate like Judson the gardener. That isn't the point. Well, what are you going to do now? Get another job. How many jobs like this do you think are left in the world? Oh, come on. Why don't you talk with Mr. Carlyle? He needs you. He doesn't need anybody. Oh, look. He'll want to go through the time and trouble to break in a new housekeeper and all. So why don't I you... could talk to him. But I won't. You won't? Why not? You could get your job back. I don't want it. I don't get it. Tell me why. Well, it's intensely personal, Joanna, and uh, and completely private. Oh, yeah? I, I've, I've known Mr. Carlyle for 20 years. Hey, has it been that long? Oh, sure. We came here the same week. I knew he was a man who drove a hard bargain. I knew he was strict and demanding. But until this morning, I never knew he was cruel. And the one thing I cannot live with is cruelty. I can't accept that in a man. So what's the man's personality to you? After all, you're his housekeeper. You're not his wife. Oh, oh, I see. I see it all now. What do you see? <laughs> you're in love with him. Oh, that's ridiculous. Well, sure, it's ridiculous. It's crazy. But it's true. It is true, isn't it? Oh, you poor kid. I am not a kid. I'm 48 years old. Oh, everybody who's in love is a kid. The whole thing is a business for kids. Now, where do you come off to be in love with Aeneas Carlyle? Oh, that's a stupid question. I, 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 I couldn't help it. Well, um, when did it begin? The day I came to work here. Oh, wow. You sure kept it to yourself. I had no business falling in love with him. Mm, yeah. Why would he even want to look at me that way? Oh, you know, Joanna, I had a dream. I still have it. I do everything so well. I take care of his house so expertly. I, I, I guess that's the word. Well, it sure is, because you sure do. And in my dream... Oh, Listen to how foolish a woman can be. I, I suddenly, one day when we're talking about oh, anything, some routine housekeeping matter, do you follow me? Mm -hmm. I might even be ahead of you. <laughs> For instance, I might be saying, Mr. Carlyle, we will have to spend $160 for a new vacuum cleaner. Oh, get to the good part, will you? And suddenly he, he'll look at me and, and he'll say... Yes. Harriet, for the first time, you'll say, Harriet, Harriet, I love you. It will suddenly have occurred to him. <laughs> oh, some dream. Oh, my. Well, crazier dreams have come true. Can you imagine him falling in love with me? Well, sure, it makes sense. Oh. Well, you're the kind of woman he wants. Oh, the society belt. They never had any attraction for him. How do you know? Oh, they've been after him all his life. Did he ever go for any? No. You're the kind of girl he wants. Well, I don't want him now. You don't? No. Not when I realize he has this streak of cruelty. Mm. Well, I heard that fight you had with him. Do you know why, why you yelled at each other like that? What are you trying to say? Well, it, it was the way you make love. Oh, you're crazy. Well, you're always having those arguments. He calls you a woman. Why? Because he's arrogant, insensitive. No. No. Because it gets a rise out of you. You're both so frustrated. You... Oh, you don't know what you're talking about. Oh, he just can't admit he's in love with you. And you don't have the courage to tell him you're in love with him. This morning it just got out of control, that's all. Now, look, Harry, look, tonight, tonight, you, you talk to him. Let him talk to me. He can't. Oh, yes, he's a man without fear when it comes to ruling the world, maybe. But so many guys like him, they're just so scared.
scared of women. I can't believe that. Well, you believe it. Now, you talk to him tonight. You'll see. You'll see I'm right. Oh, he'll be so happy. He'll just take you in his arms. No. No. It's crazy. Crazy. Marja, do you want Nias Carlyle to destroy me? It is just a painting. Is it, J.J.? Is it just a painting? Yes. It's colors on canvas and that's all. Oh? He's giving me a way out. Who told you to gamble in the market? Uh, nobody, nobody. I, I was wrong. But that doesn't solve our problem. Your problem, J.J.? If I have to liquidate now, I'll lose a fortune. I will not give up the painting. Oh, please, Marsha. Is it possible you don't understand? I understand more than you think. Aeneas Carlyle hates you. Hates you for the same reason his father hated your father. Because your family always looked down on his as vulgar, common, new rich. Uh, that was 50 years ago. Now, do you think something like that still bothers a man like Aeneas Carlyle? Something like that is the only thing that can bother a man like Aeneas Carlyle. That painting is a family heirloom. Uh, would you rather we went broke? Yes. Do you know what you're saying? I'm making a choice. If you have to deliver the stock, we'll go broke. If you deliver the painting, you'll destroy our marriage. I say give him the stock. Marsha, darling. You got... can't call me Marsha, darling, if you give away the painting. But you are being unreasonable. That is how you will destroy our marriage. We will no longer see the world the same way, appreciate the same things, agree on what's important. Marsha, I can't... I don't know what there is to discuss. Who's here? Oh, hello, Papa. So, did you get a job? Well, I, I, uh... What a question. A job. I see you still got that sign, the, the Colby's Petrol. Save the Colby's Petrol. Look, Papa... You... What's the Colby's Petrol ever do for you? I bust my back, send you through college. For, for what? For the birds, that's for what? Papa, I'm trying Any to... ain't even American birds. I figured you wanted to make something out of yourself. Become a somebody. I will. I will become a somebody. Oh, who are you kidding Hector Polisar Jr. I figured my kid could do something with that name. Oh, I will, Papa. Oh, I will. Yeah, sure, you'll become a nut. Understand? A nut, a creep. Look, I, I, I have to save the world. Oh, this is worse than I thought. No, 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 I, I'm not crazy. I, I know I can't single-handedly save the world. Huh, for a moment, you had me worried. But I can take the first step, Papa. I can be an example. I can I inspire others. Yeah? To do what? To stand up and be counted. We got a census bureau. Does that every ten years. Papa. Papa, you want me to be somebody, huh? Well, you just wait. For what? Something I have to do tonight, Papa. What's that? Tomorrow morning, the whole world will know about it. Harriet. Harriet, can I come in? Is something wrong, Joanna? Well, I just brought Mr. Carlyle a cup of tea. At this hour? He rang the kitchen. Dottie had already gone to bed, so I went myself. Harriet, he's sitting there, and he's cleaning his revolver. Do you know why? Well, maybe it's dirty. Oh, this is no time for jokes. Look, a man gets into his fifties. He's never married. You can never tell what can set him off. Now, Harriet, now you listen. Now, you listen. You go to him. Now, let me alone. Listen. No. If I go to see that man, it will be the same as giving up every bit of my pride. Oh, what good is pride? What good is it? Well, I don't know. But it's the only thing I have left in the world. It's the only thing I can call my own. I can't lose it. I can't. <sighs> All right. But you say you love him. Well, maybe that's an illusion. Well, why don't you find out? Go to him. Please, Joanna. Let me alone. I will. But you think about it. Sometimes you have to seize the moment. Otherwise, it'll be gone. Forever. Uh, Mr. Carlyle? Mm, yes. I know it's uh, late. 
But I, I saw the light from underneath the door of your study, and I... Uh, I, I, well, what is it, Mrs. Paulson? I wondered if I might speak with you. We're speaking? Uh, this, uh, this morning... Yes? This morning, a great deal was said in the heat of anger. Indeed. Well, I... I you were wondering if we could reconsider the matter. Well, I... I... The answer, Mrs. Paulson, is no, under no conditions or any circumstances. Is that what you wish to talk about? If so, the discussion is over. Is it? No, I don't think so. Look at me. I come crawling in here on my hands and knees. I discard every ounce of pride and self-respect. No one forced you to. Do you know why? No, and I don't believe I would be interested. What a fool I was. For 20 years, I've been in love with you. Is that a fact? And I permitted myself to dream that you were in love with me. That was remarkably stupid on your part. Is that all you can say to me? No. I can say good night, Mrs. Paulson. I've stripped myself there. I've cried out to you in pain and in torment. Mrs. Paulson, if I were interested in listening to melodrama, which I'm not, I would go into the theater. I am not asking you to do anything. All right. I was a fool. I realize I can't work here anymore. But isn't there one kind word you can give me? Isn't there even an ounce of pity in you? Does nothing reach you? Does nothing touch your heart? Nothing within your power. Oh, but you're wrong. There is, there is. Right here. Put that revolver down. Now I can touch your heart. Put it down. You're a fool. Don't move. It won't help you. (laughs) You moron! Look what you made me do. A tear could help you. You idiots! You made me turn over this bay. A tear? If only you could shed a tear. You made me spill water all over these papers. Show me that you can shed a tear and I'll spare your life. You, you, you're crazy. You see it? You read your death in my eyes? Please, save yourself. Shed a tear. A single tear. You can't. Very well. Let me touch your heart. This way. He who shows a woman scorn may wish he never had been born. And who will argue with the poet on that one? A sympathetic character Mr. Aeneas Carlyle may not have been. Lovable, he certainly never was. But did he really deserve the end fate had ordained for him? Well, this is a judgment that I leave for others to make. All I can do is return here shortly with Act Three, at which time justice either will or will not triumph. One thing should be obvious to everyone. Death is the greatest Democrat of all. That is... Democrat with a small d. Death has absolutely no prejudices, nor does he or she play any favorites, even with the Aeneas Carlyles. Yes, Aeneas Carlyle has held the world, as they say, in fear and trembling, and yet, when his time came, death took him by the hand, just like everyone else. I suppose that was a thing he found hardest to accept. However, since he is gone, we are no longer concerned with him. We must now consider the living. Harriet. Harriet, wake up. Huh? Harriet, what? wake up. Wake up. It? It's, it's Mr. Carlyle. He's dead. He, he's dead. I was going downstairs. I just stopped where first. I passed by the study. The door was open. I could see him. His head was on the desk. And he was dead. Oh. He was wearing his smoking jacket. And right over his heart, there was this big red stain. Oh, it was blood, Harriet. What, what are we going to do? Do? Well, there's only one thing we can do. Call the police. I'm Lieutenant Vienzo, homicide. Yes, Lieutenant. You're the uh, housekeeper, Mrs. Paulson? Uh, That is correct. I'll need your help. Now, uh, who found the body? I did. Mm -hmm. Who are you? Joanna Stiles. I'm the cook. Hmm. All right, tell me about it. Well, it was uh, six in the morning. I was walking past the study 
on my way to the kitchen, and uh, I saw him uh, laying there. Did you touch anything? Oh, no, sir. You sure? Oh, absolutely sure. I know better than that. Did you see or hear anything during the night? Oh, no, sir. Did you, Mrs. Paulson? Uh, no, sir. Do either of you know anyone who might have had a motive for killing him? Oh, no, sir. How about you, Mrs. Paulson? No, sir. A shot was fired in this room, and nobody in the rest of the house heard it, huh? Uh, well, Lieutenant, you see the carpet here is quite thick, and the walls are heavy. The room is practically soundproof. That's how Mr. Carlyle wanted it, for his privacy. So, neither of you knows anyone who might have had a motive for killing him. Oh, no, sir. How about you, Mrs. Paulson? Well, I, I, I'm i sure a man in Mr. Carlyle's position must have made enemies. But those would all be in the outside world. Hmm. Nobody here in this inside world, huh? No, not that I know of. Jerry, round up the rest of the servants. Uh, that's all right right now. Uh, Mrs. Stiles, is it? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Mrs. Paulson, would you stick around for a minute? I, I want to ask you a question. Uh, yes, sir. We haven't had a chance to put it through ballistics yet, but... This gun that was lying on the desk, this is the baby that did it, this little twenty-five caliber. Do you understand? Yes, sir. It's already been dusted for prints, but there are none. Do you know what that means? Well, it, it could mean they were wiped off. Right. So uh, it also means it couldn't have been suicide. Furthermore, if the wound was self-inflicted, there'd have been powder burns. There aren't any. Do you follow all of this? I believe so. Why are you so nervous? But I don't think I'm nervous. Oh, I think I know why. It's because I'm smoking a cigarette. You're scared I'll get ashes on this valuable Persian rug. Well... Or maybe I'll set the butt down on this expensive table. I didn't say that. Not in words. I can see you keep this place like a pin. That was my job. Was? Well, now that Mr. Carlyle is dead... Yeah, well, you really kept the place neat. I, uh, I want to ask you a question. That is, if, if I may. Well, certainly. Is there a leak in the ceiling? Oh? Well, no, not that I know of. Mm, I thought so. Doesn't look like there's any dripping from up there, but... I'll tell you what my problem is. Everything on this desk is nice and neat. He's got some papers lying there. And those papers are wet. Wet? Yeah, they're wet. So, what I want to know is, how did those papers get wet? You can see they're wet, can't you? Well, yes. Now, how did that happen? I, uh, I'm sure I don't know. Mm, and his sleeve. You could see the stain on his sleeve, his, his left sleeve, around the elbow. That was wet, too. Yes. Do you have any idea how that sleeve could have gotten wet? I'm afraid not. Oh, excuse me. Uh, yeah, Jack, bring him right in. I, I I didn't do it. You didn't, huh? No, sir, I am innocent. You weren't picketing the house? Well, yes, I was, but I... You didn't have a pretty good argument with him yesterday morning? Uh, yes, I did. You didn't threaten to kill him? No. No, I didn't. You did not say to him, tomorrow morning you may not be here. I, uh, I... Uh... Why, well, I, I may have said that. Mm, witnesses heard you say that. But it doesn't mean I intended to kill him. What does it mean? It means, well, maybe a higher power would intervene to save the Colby's petrol. Were you here last night? Well, what's the answer? Well, uh, yeah. Now, uh, outside the window over there are some footprints. Shoe prints. Would they happen to be yours? Uh, yes. But I... But, but what? I didn't kill him. Then why did you come here? I... Wanted to kill him. Yes. I was determined to kill him. And? Uh, I sneaked over the wall and I came around to the rear of the house looking for an open window. I saw a light and I peeked in. And there he was. He was sitting at his desk. <laughs> Suddenly I said to myself, well, what am I doing here? Kill him? How? With what? I don't know anything about killing. Isn't that what I hold against him? That he's the killer? I walked away. I just walked away and I went home. Here. Yeah, yeah. Jack, take him downtown and book him as a material witness. But I, I, I didn't kill him. Mm, 
Stick to that story, kid, and, and we'll see how it comes out. Lieutenant Rienzo? Yeah? Is that so? Well, sure. Sure. Bring him down here. I tell you, Mrs. Paulson, it, it never rains, but it pours. We got ourselves another prime suspect. Mr. Bowers, isn't it true that you owed Mr. Carlyle a large sum of money? Uh, technically, uh, no. Well, I'll put it this way. Wouldn't you have to raise a large sum of money to satisfy an obligation to Mr. Carlyle? Oh, uh, you're talking about amalgamated. Well, I, uh... You'd have to uh, sell him 10,000 shares at 40. Well, yes. And the stock opened this morning at 90. Yeah, but this is only the 11th. You don't have to make delivery till the 30th. So the stock could fall in that time. 50 points in 19 days? <laughs> is that likely? Where were you last night? Uh, home. Home? All night? Yes. yes. At about three in the morning, were you in an all-night diner called Chippy's? Huh? Uh, well, let me see. I thought I, you said uh, you were home all night. Uh, well, well, yes. Yes, the night. Uh, but uh, 3 a.m. technically is uh, the morning, wouldn't you say? Well, you can have it any way you want. Were you in Chippy's? Now, let me help refresh your memory. That is, if you want me to. You see, we've had men out all through the neighborhood looking for witnesses. Chippy told one of my detectives that uh, along about 3 a.m., a very nervous-looking fellow came into his place, a fellow answering your description. Oh? The fellow was so nervous, he spilled half his coffee. Hmm. All right. You were here. Uh, and I was in the neighborhood. You were in the house. I said I was in the neighborhood. Why? You know why. Do I? Well, didn't you just tell me? He had me over a barrel. And let me tell you something. I know I don't have to say a word. The detective who called on me read me my rights. But I don't care. It was worse than you think. Well, no. Oh, yes. yes, yes. He was forcing me to do something that would have broken up my marriage. He had offered me a way out. The Duquesne painting. What's that? It doesn't matter. But I should have killed him. Should have? Yes, I should have. And I was going to. I even got a gun. My wife was asleep. I sneaked out of the house. I, I came down here. And I was shaking all over at the thought of what I had to do. I, well, I needed a drink. But all the bars were closed, so I went into that diner for a cup of coffee. And? Uh, it didn't help. It kept getting worse. It's probably why the fellow behind the counter noticed me. I, I was shaking so badly, he... He said, got a problem, Mac? Well, what could I tell him? That I was frightened out of my wits? That I couldn't do it? That I, I just couldn't commit murder? Hmm? So I went back home. Yeah, well, we'll uh, have to take you downtown. No, oh, I understand. I'm sorry. No, no, don't be, please. I, I didn't kill him. But I wanted to. I should have. And so, uh, I really don't care. Eddie? Goodbye, Lieutenant. Hmm. He'll care. After a while. I've seen it. It wears off. You know something, Mrs. Paulson? What I've got here is what the man called an embarrassment of riches. You know what I mean? I, uh, I I'm not sure. Well, in the average case, it's all you can do to get one suspect lined up. I've got two, wouldn't you say? Well, yes. Either one of them could have done it. Which one do you think is guilty? Well, I... I couldn't say. Each has the motive, the opportunity. We got both of them at the scene of the crime at just about the time of the murder. I think they'll go for the kid. Mr. Pulisard? Yeah. It's not right. It isn't fair, but... Well, that's how it goes. Do you know what I'm talking about? Uh, no. I mean, he's a scruffy, wild-eyed kid. He's got long hair. Oh, so many nice young men have long hair these days. Yeah, but on him, it, they don't look so good. Well, a smart lawyer will build up the kid's instability, maybe prove insanity. Well, one way or another, the kid won't get hit too badly. But it is a shame. He, he shouldn't get hit at all. You know why? No. Because the kid didn't do it. Oh? Are you saying Mr. Bowers killed Mr. Carlyle? Bowers? Well, Bowers was angry enough. 
But you see, it must have occurred to him he really had nothing to gain. Killing Carlyle would not have relieved him of his obligation to deliver the stock. He would still owe it to the estate. Mm, I don't think he did it. Well, who did? You mean you don't know Mrs. Paulson? Why, you did. Me? I think I knew it the minute I walked into the room. I know it bothered me. The papers on his desk. The papers? They were wet. Now, how could they get wet? Where did the water come from? There was only one source. There was water in the vase on his desk that held the flowers. But how could the water get from the vase to the desk? You know how, don't you? I... I don't know what you're talking about. You came in here. You picked up the gun. He stood up to try to defend himself. He must have uh, knocked over the vase. Am I right? Well, you shot him. And then, because you're an expert housekeeper, the habits of a lifetime took over. You probably weren't even aware of it. But you had to tidy things up. You knew he had to wipe the fingerprints off the gun. But I'm sure you didn't realize that you picked up the vase and set it straight. Am I right? Well, Mrs. Paulson? You... You... You you can't prove it. Of course I can't prove it. But you're an honest woman. You know you can't let one or the other of them pay for a murder that belongs to you. You know that, don't you? I... 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 Mrs. Paulson... You know you won't be able to live with it. Sooner or later, you'll tell me what happened. Tell me now. Oh. All right, Lieutenant. I'll tell you. And she told him. You know exactly what she told him because you were there when it happened. And you heard every word of it. When she told it to the jury, they almost burst into tears. And the judge gave her the lightest sentence within his power. Maybe justice was done. After all, you can't fool around with love. I'll be back shortly. Who killed Aeneas Carlyle? Hector Polisard wanted to. John Jacob Bowers would have liked to. Harriet Paulson actually picked up a gun and fired the fatal shot. But do you know who triggered the whole business? Joanna Stiles, the cook. You see, Harriet Paulson lived with a fantasy. And it was enough for her. But Joanna urged her to try to make that fantasy come true. Let this be a lesson to all of us. Let sleeping dogs lie. Or... Never awaken a dreamer. Our cast included Joan Shea, Ralph Bell, Evie Juster, Earl Hammond, and Robert Maxwell. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Please, have a look around before we go in, Matthew. Ah, uh, just be a second or two. Great. Where on earth did these birds come from? Keep away from me, you crazy creatures. What's the matter, Matthew? Oh, they're birds. Hundreds of them with beaks like small knives. Birds? Actually dive bombing right at me as if they didn't want me in there. Hey, can I put my eyes out? Oh, I don't hear any of them anymore. Uh, Gone as suddenly as they came. How? What kind of birds, Matthew? Well, they look like those small birds on some of our Mayan artifacts. Must we go in there? Well, I don't see why not. But because the idea of hundreds of birds in a cave this far underground bothers me. I don't understand it. And, and why would they want to attack you? Well, there's only one way we'll ever find an explanation. Now, are you coming with me or am I going in there alone? This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant... Thank mm-hmm. you.